Now we are recording. Right. Welcome everyone to this core interim meeting. Uh, I'm Marco Tiloka, co chairing with uh, Jaime Jimenez. Not well applies. Please uh, get familiar with them if you are not uh, already. Okay, so we have had some kind of agenda bashing already. And Michael, you wanted to mention something about stateless. Please go ahead. Hi. So um, I just pasted two links into the notes. Um, there is one pull request relating to automatic key management that um, I would like to get a little more review on. Um, this is issue number 11. Um, and then we have five items um, that are issues that were raised that I believe are in various states of won't fix. Um, and so I would like to also get some comments about that. One of them, number eight, is related to the pull request. Um, and the other um, is probably, um, probably could be some could be closed. Um, so basically, I just need uh, a little bit more help to close these to just say this is what I've done is okay. Um, and, um, and then I will post a, a new version of the draft this afternoon, I hope. Um, and that's about it, really. Do you want me to like share any of these issues if you want? Does people want to have a gander at them here or? Please go ahead. Uh, okay. So uh, application window. So this is the pull request that's open that has to do with automatic key management. Um, so uh, what I think happened is that there was a... Um, uh, there's two parts. First of all, the, the, there is this. There is this. The, the, this relates to the fact that you may want to encrypt the. Uh, you probably want to encrypt the token that you are sending out, such that you can recognize it coming back with it while keeping it privacy, private and integral. Um, and there was a reference to some, you know, ways of doing things, and this somehow wound up with a reference to key management and there's no key management involved because no key agreement in, is, is necessary because there's no no second party involved it's just the single party makes up a key and encrypts stuff so that's what this text kind of uh changes significantly um and um there's just the question of you know how often you need to rekey to avoid uh reusing nonces that's really the major part um, and that is actually dealt with with this text, with a reference to um, uh, 8613 sender sequence number. It's the same problem. If you do the same thing, use the same sequence numbers, you're probably all good. Um, and then I had some other text here about, you know, how often, how many outstanding things you might need and how big a window you might need. And so that may require some a little bit of someone to sanity check uh, my math and assumptions here that essentially you know if you're sending out things that you know you can expect and you expect to have a response within say two seconds which seems very very generous that um the number of requests outstanding determines your your replay window and i assume this is like an ipsec like we replay window where you have some uh set of bits that you set and then you have a low water ma uh, count mark uh for for that um but you could implement something simpler even if you wanted to um for that so i just really looking for some review of this text um and an endorsement ours too and uh then i will post the document 
issues. I just closed two as we were talking about. This one relates to what we just talked about. This one we think is won't fix. And this is some strange discussion about whether or not we're updating 7252, which this document does. So I don't know what the discussion was really about. That's about right. it. Can, can I go back to the key management thing? Yep. I reviewed an earlier version um, of this. Mm -hmm. I see that you now have started to put in some math there, uh, which I would have to check. I, my knee-jerk reaction is that it's entirely wrong. Okay. But I have to read it in, in detail. Uh, so Specifically, this me? about the replay window. This part here. Yes. Yes. Okay. I I could accept it's completely wrong. Um, so that's what I want to get right here. Right. Uh, so um, I think uh, this is uh, maybe what people should should focus on when they're reviewing this. Whether the advice that we are giving uh, here. Uh, actually is, is, is right and is actionable. And um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I have to read it uh, more than 30 seconds. Sure. So that's what I'm looking for is, is uh, somewhat longer thinking about what this means and, um, um, and then whatever changes you think we need to do. I won't take any more time. Any more comments or objections? Okay, uh, Michael, since you mentioned about resubmitting even this afternoon, that'll be great. Um, Hi, and I had a chat, and considering the work you put on this, uh, we think you'd be fair and good if you want to add yourself as second co-author of the document, if you're fine with it. Yeah, I'm. I, at least I need to do that to make the submitting easier, so I'll do that. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot for taking this, Michael. Okay, great. Okay, uh, we can move to the next item. Uh, I understand John will show the slides by himself. Uh, John, if there are updated slides compared to the ones in the data tracker, please push um, uh, this latest version later on. Sure, no, there's no difference. What's in the data tracker is what I've got here. Thank you. Um, Please try to be within 60 minutes or so. We want to reserve 10 to 15 minutes in the end for one more topic, uh, a sure. point on the business directory. Thank <clears> you. <throat> OK, so I need to. Okay, so uh, just just talking about the uh, the alternative blockwise transfer options for faster transmission of data, in particular in a lossy type network environment. So, uh, just to, uh, go through uh, requirements reminder what we did in the Dash One updates. Uh, some things I observed as part of the implementation, which raises some questions about uh, what is the best way to move forward and you know, what's the next steps. Okay, so just as a reminder, we want to be able to transmit data faster rather than waiting for the, the latency turnaround of send and some sort of act coming back and then the next packet and going on and so forth. Rather, be able to send uh, a, a block of data, but obviously subject to congestion control, which is covered there in the, the draft. Uh, one of the challenges we have um, is that we are likely to be working in lossy type environments because we are uh, moving forward to uh, mitigate some sort of DDoS attack, and because the DDoS attacks are taking place, it's likely to be lossy. So we need to have some good recovery mechanism for blocks that get lost if you're sending them out as a, a, a big chunk. Uh, we also need the requirement to be able to descend unidirectional data in the same way that we can send a single non-packet. Um, and if we don't get an answer back, it's not the end of the world. We want to be able to send out a set of non-blocks to comprise of a non-body, and we don't necessarily need to worry about getting a response back. And the reason for that is that, um, again, with DDoS attacks, is that you're likely to have a pipe flooded somewhere, and so you may have traffic going in one direction, but unlikely to come and return in the other. 
The uh, faster blocks, quick blocks, are modeled on block one, block two, but they are not an addition. Sorry, they're not a replacement for them. They're an addition to. If there are any questions as we go down here, just you know, please say. Okay, so just general updates to the Dash 01. We updated the applicability scope just to make it more relevant. We moved away from having our own error code and using uh, piggybacking on 408 instead. <clears throat> We've renamed the options to Quick Block 1 and 2 rather than uh, Block 3 and 4, so that uh, Quick Block 1 models Block 1 and Quick Block 2 models Block 2. Uh, the options are marked unsafe and cache behavior is updated. So that basically, um, we're not expecting the cache to be able to cache individual blocks. Uh, things before. We've moved the congestion control uh, text into a new dedicated section to break that specifically out. Uh, we were fairly normative in the use of tokens, um, fairly prescriptive. They're now just pulled out into a separate section and it's uh, more generic, the text that's in the various places and just other kind of edit typos, all those kind of things. So in terms of moving forward to the actual implementation that I did, <clears throat> I'm using libcoapp as a base, which I'm relatively familiar with. And I have raised PR 554 uh, to move all the block one, block two handling out of the application layer down into libcoapp. So it's up to libcoapp to do all the recovery, uh, if necessary, on block one, block two operations and only pass the large item of data up to the application, or if the application wants it, just the individual blocks, but they've already been uh, checked out and recovered, etc. And then on top of that, having done that work, I then added in the support for the quick block one and two, based on the fact that everything's just there and there in the libco app area. So all we just need to do is say, well, we're happy to have block one, block two, and let libco app get on with it and check with the remote end whether things work or not. And at some point, when we're happy with that code, it will then become also a PR into Libco app. Some observations of uh, from the implementation. At the moment, uh, an uh, environment can support either Quick Block One or Quick Block Two or neither of them or all of them. Um, this gave me some challenges if, with the fact that we could support only one of the two. Uh, when we come to find out whether the remote end likes us or not, it's a critical option. Uh, we get some sort of response coming back, um, but it then is unclear if we're sending both block one and block two out in that initial packet. Um, the response that comes back, was it referring to the block one? Was it referring to the block two? Unless we update the spec to say it's either both of quick block one and two or neither of block one and two are supported just makes life a lot easier in particular because it's very difficult to work out what critical option is not liked by the remote end um just the standard 7252 just says something in the diagnostic payload it doesn't talk about formatting um and a non-package just returns an empty reset uh, and just libcoap happens to return the bad critical option as an option, but I don't think that's standard across all the implementations, so we can't rely on that kind of thing. So kind of a suggestion question for mutual support is that we either, either both quick block one and two have to be implemented or neither of them. And are there any thoughts on that? Christian Amses, do I uh, do you expect that the um, quick block one and two options are supported on every resource on the same server the same way? Uh, no. The basically for server, if he sees a quick block one or quick block two coming in, he knows um, that that particular functionality is enabled by the client. He has the ability to say, "I like you" or "I don't like you" as a critical option. But there can be sessions that come from client A and client B. Client A doesn't use quick block, client B does. As far as the server is concerned, uh, the individual sessions will be treated as appropriate using either the old block or the quick block. I was rather thinking the other way around, a single client interacting with different uh, resources on the same server. Um, OK. so. Are they, if we're talking about the same session or different sessions? If you're talking about different sessions, then what is a session? 
Uh, session is a connection to an endpoint coming from an endpoint that's got a, a particular source port. So okay. typically, uh, typically in our environment, that will be a DTLS session as underlying it all. Or, or put put differently, is the client expected to, if if the client discovers the support for quick um quick block one and two, um is it supposed to remember that about that server or about that resource in general? I mean, when when is this even uh um so so what's what's the case in which this actually is a this actually is a decision to make? Because okay, okay so I originally thought that this is come something like. The client knows that the server supports this and it just goes ahead and does it because it's part of that particular application. Yeah, well, okay, so um, we're not mandating quick block uh, for the uh, dots type environment. So it okay. could be that the dots client has it and the dot server does not, depending on manufacturers and all the rest of it. So that's why put in, we just need to see whether. The remote end likes it or not and if it doesn't fine we just say carry on with the original block stuff but if it does like it we then use the, the block stuff for faster transmission and recovery etc but then supporting them as a single thing or not seems to make sense to me because yeah I, I, if if it's if you start with it and fail then you fail over to a traditional blockwise transfer and mix i mean if if only one of them would be supported that would probably incur mixing block types and that's a can of worms I don't think we want to open. I, I mean, I agree with you. I just, uh, it's at the moment, I say the spec is, you can do either of them, but I think it's got to be mandated that you support both or neither. Okay, thanks, Christian. Okay, congestion control. Um, some things came out of it. So at the moment we have in place that every max payloads, every 10 packets by default, uh, we wait for an act timeout before we then send the next 10 if there's a fairly large set of data to pass backwards and forwards. Uh, we have the possibility of using CON every max payload just to reduce the turnaround times, and that works pretty well. But that does not work. The CON fails if there's unidirectional traffic loss, or likelihood of that. Um, and, but the non environment just always, uh, the non types traffic always waits for the act timeout for the next packet. Okay. So, the, so the 10th packet or the max payload packet. If that's a non, it'll always wait for the act timeout. Now that slows things down quite considerably because we're waiting the two seconds. Um, and we also can't assume that max payloads is configured because it's a default at both ends to do a trigger. So we can't just rely on the 10th packet. Uh, therefore, we can go faster because we're sending some sort of response back because we know it's the 10th packet. Also tied up with this is if we are probing for whether quick block one or two is sent, I can only send out the first block and wait for a response. I can't send out max payloads and then suddenly get back 10. We don't like you, uh, critical options. So in the startup environment, the first time we try anything out, I can only send a singular packet. So we can't just rely on that for some sort of trigger. So thinking about this, the suggestion is uh, something in the max payload packet to indicate that the other end, if it can, uh, sends back a response. If that response gets lost, we still wait for the act timeout. If not, we can then carry on transmitting f uh, you know, faster. So one thought, and this is not uh, entirely what it is, so it's just taking the standard block format of num, m, and S -S 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 -X, add in an R bit, and if the R bit is set, then we then expect the remote end to send back some sort of immediate response. Quick block will be 231, continue. Um, block two will be an issue of a get. So does that kind of thing work for people or not? We already have something for that. Uh, that's no response. So I think that what should happen here is that um, th them, I don't really know what the best default is for, for a block one transfer, but um, you can control whether the server should respond to that non request by adding the uh, no response option and that option would then be sent by the client every max payload to indicate that the server that is it's asking for a response. Even yeah. if it's okay, so response. yeah, okay, I had a quick look at that. So basically, we're saying the first nine packets need to have no response set, 
and the tenth packet not, rather than the tenth packet has got it, and the nine previous don't. What 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 you could if if that's a matter of of traffic that you don't want to have, um, it would be an option to say that um, a quick one transfer implicitly has an implicit default value for no response, and if you do want to have a response then set no response with an explicit value of, I think it's zero, um, that indicates that you want the response in, in all cases. Okay. Yep, certainly that would work. And then uh, that would work in both quick block one and quick block two. Yep, uh, I will work with that. Thanks very much for that. Okay, so the quick block two implementation uh, was the easiest to implement. Uh, the uh, the size required for missing blocks as options was difficult to compute. So we're just looking at when we're building up um, the error response, the 408 response, not the 408, the sort of the, the response is coming back and saying, I need some more. Yeah, it's a 408 the response that comes back and says, this is the list of missing blocks. We have a challenge of uh, computing easily computing the size of the packet to hold all the missing blocks and it's very dependent on the actual size of the block dot num value um, so you know, as a suggestion is we just limit the numbers of the quick block options to max payloads which then also nicely ties in up with what a server can send at once and I am pretty confident I have to double check the math but I'm pretty confident even with worst case block nums uh, we'll get all that into a single uh, diagnostic 408 response packet. Does that kind of idea work or have I missed something? It's not fully clear to me why you have to calculate that other than for the for the sending side to assemble the packet. And as long as there is no requirement that all the missing blocks are in that response, why does this need to be agreed on? Uh, okay, well, it just ha happens to be within libcoap is that you build your PDU and you then try and send it in. It then chokes because it's too large. Yeah. Rather than as you're building the PDU, it computes the size and but, returns an error you can't add in the next one. But but this is some this is something more implementation specific, and if in in that particular implementation you in, you take the PDU as long as you think in that particular for that particular application is good. For example, to to get all those max payloads in there, then you put in as not many numbers as you get. And if you are still missing blocks, you can still ask for them later when you're getting the next uh, the next blocks around. Okay, so a secondary challenge in that is that the CDDL is defining an array in CBOR. And the array size is defined as a count. So you then, if you say, oh, well, I'm going to add in X missing blocks, then the array size for that is going to be X. But if you can only get a subset of X in, then you've got to go back and recompute what the array size is when you build the CBOR. So Did it's, you consider using a CBOR sequence? Um, to, to an extent, yes. But it still requires something that says, which well, effectively ends up as an array. It, it just is, there are this number of elements that follow. Okay. So you could use an indefinite length uh, encoding, if that helps. Okay. I, I was not aware of that, but that may be a way forward then. It, 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 just, it just is, I, you know, I, I ran into a kind of a circular loop here and yeah. get, get it working and getting stuff through. <laughs> So what, what you can do is that as long as your number of elements is less than 23, I think 23 is the magic limit, um, then you can start writing the array and put the number in at the end. But again, that's more of an implementation thing. Uh, yep, that, that certainly would work. Yeah, so you, it's an implementation thing, but we may just have to make a suggestion that there may be a challenge here um, yeah. within the text. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Okay, so quick block one. So uh, I did struggle with the CDDL, and thanks, Carsten, for your help and feedback, feedback and working out. I believe I've got it right now. Uh, we just had to add some Seaboar knowledge into LibCart. We couldn't just assume that it would, could pull in a Seaboar library, but the actual Seaboar knowledge required within LibCart is very, very small. It's a significant subset of what's required for Seaboar. So that wasn't that difficult to do. The next quick block implementation challenge I had was 
tracking tokens. So if we are sending a max payload of packets out at once, we then, and they all have unique tokens following the current rules, we then have to track that max payloads of tokens and then garbage collect when everything kind of gets itself sorted out. And we certainly cannot reply, rely on, rather, the max payload packet may not arrive at the target end, so the response that we get back from uh, the server may be against a previous token. So we have to maintain all those different tokens, uh, again, down within libcoap, so we can then just see what's going on, so we can pass the correct original token back to any application should he need to know what that's what what's going on there. So it, it's tracking tokens. Um, I haven't really done that code because it just needs a lot of it and just trying to think of, are there any ways of getting around this? And one of the thoughts I had that, that we have an associated response um, as in observing uh, when uh, traffic is coming back from the server and they all have the same token. Is it worth considering an associated request for quick block one where all the tokens can be the same? As the obviously caveat that you know if there's any retry request, we'll definitely use a different token. So I don't know if there are any thoughts on that. I also have another alternative which is post this slide, which I'll come up in a minute, but I just want to hear your feedback on this one. I think that I, mean, I, I think that if 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 you go that way, it will need a lot more thought in with respect to what it means for for other for other things for other mm -hmm. associated responses. So if if there is an easier way, and if it's not the thing that's coming up in the next slide, I can suggest one. Um, then it's probably better to take that. Okay, and I'll hear your suggestion. I say I have one. It's not on the next slide. Um, I did. I didn't add it into the slide. I only thought of it this morning. So, did you consider computer tokens? Computer tokens. Sorry. Where the token is a function of something that's constant for the whole thing, plus something that varies in in a well-defined way. So you don't actually have to remember all these tokens. Yes. Okay. So my solution was that uh, the, the the bottom thirty two bits would be a token, and the top thirty two bits would be the block number, and then uh, so I'm I'm then using up to the full eight bytes of the token. Um, I know that there is stateless token coming downstream, but I didn't particularly want to go there just yet. So in terms of the computed one, I would have the bottom thirty two bits are the um, the tokens to track, if you like, and then the, the top 32 bits will just uh, be whatever the current block number is. And we can then just do some math when we look at the token. I know that tokens are supposed to be opaque. Yes, the, the receiver should not... Um... So, the, so if, if we're quick block, we're sending it to the server. The server is totally opaque, and he sends back whatever... Uh, token he wants to match against, but the client in sending it knows that I generated a token that is the first 32 yes. bits is uh, the token number and the top 32 bits is the block number or something. Yeah, my, my assumption here is that the server never needs to to actually uh, keep a track of tokens uh, because it uh, uh, kind of responds in an instance. Yes. Um, so th there is no tracking at the server. The client side, by by building the tokens in a specific way, you can make tracking them much easier. Yeah, I, I think I think that probably is the better way to go. As I say, I thought about that this morning. So, and you oh, okay. came up with the same answer. So that's brilliant. <laughs> great, great stuff. Great minds think alike. Thank you. Um, so really, it's just uh, moving on to the next step. So you know, we'll come up. We'll update O2 with what we follow through this discussion. I'm sure there's going to be a couple other tweaks, um, maybe come out somewhere else. Um, update the implementation so that we make sure that we haven't um, forgotten something, um, that it all works and viable. Um, and then go for a uh, working group last call. So, so I missed part of the discussion. I, I like the, the plan. Um, I missed part of the discussion because I had some, some weird WebEx audio uh, problem. I think it was um, slide six, at the end of slide six, in case you want to show it to the others, right? 
Yeah, it, it was simply uh, one one slide earlier, actually. Um, it was uh, even one earlier than that. Um, yes. No, uh, five. Um, no, four, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, I, I uh, have a, a little problem here, uh, which is calling the option quick block uh, creates two problems. Mm -hmm. uh, one is uh, the IETF has a major standardization effort that is called quick without a K. Right. And if we want to create confusion, uh, because people will be starting to think about uh, COIP over quick and, and all that uh, at some point. If we want to create confusion, then we we give the thing a name that sounds like quick. So that that's my one problem. Okay, so uh, some, how about something like fast? Yeah, th that's my other problem. Um, actually, I think the distinguishing property is not so much the speed, but the robustness. Mm -hmm. um, so we we are do doing all this because it needs to work in in a uh, environment that that has uh, some problems. Uh, so maybe having a word that that uh, um, expresses that robustness uh, would be better than than uh, replacing it by another synonym for fast. Okay, um, certainly the word robust works immediately thinking about it but then people will say well this is the alternative to use for the old block one block two which is not necessarily the case well it is an alternative it is an alternative but, but they just say well forget block one block two will go with the robust version because it implies it's it's better and then some people say well why didn't you come out with the biz for the uh, uh 7959 or whatever it is the blocking one yeah that's actually a good question anyway. I concur with Karsten, this is Michael Richardson, that the, the naming is unfortunate. Um, but on top of that, if I can jump in, because um, I think you had a second point, Karsten, um, there are no references to quick QI without the K in the document. Um, I only really hadn't paid much attention to it till today. Um, and the quick people did, a. Uh, it looks very similar uh, in lots of ways. Um, and so some contrast to it and some reference to their congestion mechanism might uh, would probably be prudent because if not, the, the um, transport people are going to tell ask us to do that anyway. That's going to be the first question as well. So it sounds like quick. Have you reviewed all of the congestion control issues in quick? <laughs> right. Thanks, and, guys. And and and, and I, 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 you know, yeah. I mean, it can be me saying it now, or someone else in six months, right? So, um, that's I think the 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 major thing. Um, I, I, and a, a question of why we're not doing block bis is a good question, um, and uh, and probably should be dealt with. Um, what what is the use case where block mode is is perfectly fine um and you you you've restricted it to 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 d dots uh or d dos is in and dots mode and that's very interesting um um but uh so figuring out when it's what it's useful might help us name it better um i'm not fond of robust either um but maybe we can come so up I have with something another else. word I have another word that I can suggest. So I have a synonym dictionary on my laptop, like every decent person should have. And that suggests tough. Tough block. It's good. I, I'm, I'm seeing visions of clockwork, the clockwork orange movie myself, but. <laughs> Bunch of toughs on the block, right? Beat you up. Um, okay, so maybe a word like resilient. Yeah, that's the long version. Uh, so durable, resilient, tough, hard wearing, long lasting, sturdy, strong. But tough, I think, uh, um, has both the robustness in it and the bullying part, uh, which is really uh, an important uh, property. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, but we can take this offline. This, this it's definitely a bike shed. Um, but I wanted to point out that Quick m might have some some yep. implications. Thank you. Oh, on on the on the distinguishing it from from the regular block wise transfer that Michael brought up, um, I'd like to um, throw in that um, the thing that traditional block can do, and this, if it can, it's not thought through, and it would need a lot of thought, is working both with atom uh, with atomic operations and um, random access. So this is, and, and this has implications for the proxying of it. Yeah, this basically doesn't like random access. Yeah. So traditional block mode would let me get uh, a byte 2000 of an object without getting the rest of it. And this Correct. won't let me do it. Correct. That's an interesting point. Well, you, you could do it, but it just, it, it gets messy. I, I even think that this can, as it is now, this can be a very solid base for um, 7959 bis um, if we were uh, to do one at any time. Um, it will just take some time to get the messiness and, uh, and the norm and the precise and the precision precise implications of random access out. Sure. Okay, Carsten, you had a second point? Not really. No. Well, I missed another point, but I, I need to read up what you did there. Okay. So let's not redo that. Uh, John, just a small comment. In session 3-4, I think, in, in the draft, when you explain quick block 2, uh, you, you introduce uh, in line this repeat request terminology. That's essentially the case where you're asking back for block number 0. Yes. But it is, I mean, are you borrowing this definition from somewhere else? I couldn't find it in the blockwise RFC. Um, no, it's 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 just something that came up because there was a challenge of are right, are you just asking for if you, if uh, with block zero in the standard um, block two case is that you just um, it's all the the block numbers sorry the the more bit is zero but it's the the issue is is that if you only want to ask for one block you get it when you're using the old block two but with the new block two if you ask for block zero you'll get the next 10 which may or may not be what you want to get back and so you have uh, you know block you can identify from block one or further blocks that these, this is a subsequent block that got lost but how do you handle just that initial block that got lost okay perhaps you can just expand uh, just expand in line what repeat request uh, can mean because then i think the examples don't cover that exact uh, value of the quick block two option uh, you never miss a block zero of a response so yep so we we can update the text to include that great thank you thank you so i guess it concludes your Presentation on this topic, sure. right? Uh, yeah. More comments, anyone? Okay, well, we have plenty of time left for the next item. Uh, okay, yeah, I need to actually duck out and go somewhere else. But thank you guys for listening, and uh, especially thank you for all the uh, excellent positive feedback that you've come back with. Much, much appreciated. Thank you, John. Okay, we can switch to the resource directory topic then, and especially the latest discussion we've had mostly yesterday uh, on the usage of the anchor attribute. Uh, so Christian, floor is yours. Um, just hello, just because my screen sharing has traditionally not worked in WebEx, um, could you maybe call up the um, the document that I just linked in the in the minute? It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's not much, it's just basically um, quick slides for, for the topics that 
I'd like to talk about. Yeah, just scroll a minute. Right, almost sharing. Here we go. You see? Sure. Okay. Um. So um. On top of the things that we discussed last time, uh, Esco has been as kind as to throw in a bunch of review um, of review comments. Uh, most of them are just uh, finding finding small mistakes that that have uh, persisted in the document. Um, there's one um, good point about the necessity of anchor, though, and there's been a bit of back and forth. And uh, long story short. Um, of all those interpretations that are floating around for 6690, which does leave some room for ambiguity, but um, probably has a right uh, interpretation somewhere, um, the the decision we took in 2018 basically was to expand everything at lookup because you could interpret things this or that way. Um, the discussion with Esco has shown me that the Basically, the only implementation and the only interpretation that necessitated this particular insertion of the anchor under all conditions um, was my own interpretation. So um, I know it's rather late in the process, and um, that was also part of my ori original response. Um, if chairs and group think that it's too late to do anything about this, and we are saying that we have different, that it's hard to interpret and we have different implementations that do all those things. Um, I'm fine with leaving it as is at is, um, but at the same time, um, I'd hate for my own mistake to kind of blow up every response to a resource directory request by a factor of two, which is not precisely that, but pretty close. So um, especially with long host names, it can easily, or, or ports, it can easily be that um, the response is almost twice as long if we serve it with the response anchors. Yeah, um, so uh, what do we do about this? Um, the two ways, so I think that the, the only two ways forward are to um, say that, yeah, um, it, not all of this may be necessary, but there is this wiggle room and there have been those interpretations and this is why we keep it or to go through the precise resolution steps one more and um, kick out the necessity of inserting an anchor along with precise rules um, as they are now, but different rules that say when you need to expand the anchor. This would not render any existing resource directory non-compliant. It would just um, make the lookup smaller for resource directories that decide to follow that update. Um, the email that I remember, uh, one the suggestion was, if rel uh, is not present, then anchor is allowed, and if it is, no, sorry, yeah, was it um, the other way around? Yeah, so, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that that was a suggestion which I uh, did not put in here in this detail because I think that um, the only reason this so so. Um, there is no implementation and no interpretation that of the of the resolution rules where this would really makes a difference. Um, and the only one that needs the anchor in there is mine of 2018. And if that goes away, um, even those additional rules about HR, uh, so, so the, the more rules don't make it easier and they don't make the payload smaller. And yeah, so it's, so, it's more about if, if we do a change, then we can, do the full change that is enabled by kicking the 2018 interpretation. So whatever we do, um, making things uh, depend on an interpretation of rel sounds about the, the wrongest possible that we can do. Um, I mean, yeah, looking retro re retroactively, if we were still in 2012 and could uh, re rediscuss the the uh, rules that are in, in section 2.1 of RFC 6690, um, actually looking at the relationship uh, might have been a good way to avoid that complexity. 
but uh, I mean, we, we have to live what's in there right now. And I think the rule should be put in the anchor unless uh, you don't need it. Yeah. And uh, now the question is, um, is the, the interpretation of Section 2.1 of RFC 6690 sufficiently stable that we can state when you don't need it? And there is a little bit uh, questionable in the 2.1b, where where it says when specified. It's not entirely clear that that this is really well defined. But um, I think we can uh, explain this a little more. Um, and I'm, I don't know how much variation is between implementations about that. Uh, but other than that. Um, Obviously, the implementation of A is, is irrelevant here, because if the anchor is there, it's there. Uh, so we are only looking at, at B and C, and uh, we can uh, um, find out what implementations do about uh, these two cases. Yep. So on the, the, the other thing I wanted to say is that internally, inside a resource directory implementation, um, the, the only correct way to implement this is to, to expand the anchor in the database. Because uh, what, what you will uh, in the end send back uh, to, to a lookup client, um, it's hard to, to predict that. And the decision whether to include the anchor or not uh, should be based on what you actually send back to the client. Um, I don't think that storing the fully expanded anchor is practical in the implementation because the base might change in the course of an update. But the anchor, the whether the pre, I think that the simplification. So if we go that route, I'll go through the implementations I looked at in 2018 all again. Um, and I think that what will come out of it is that the anchor either is necessary or is not necessary to include. Um, and then either that relative anchor can be stored or it um, or, or no anchor is stored. Yes, but I think the, the important part, what you're talking about is an optimization. I'm talking about the, the principle. The important part is that the resource directory always behaves like it had stored the anchor. It, it behaves like it had stored the anchor in its original form. Um, it does not behave like it stored the anchor in its resolved form because the resolution base can change when the base changes. Yes. I agree with that. I'm sorry, just a, a stupid question. But I mean, when performing lookup, the, the response will be a resolved anchor or not. I didn't get that. My understanding is that if, if even if you register in this new proposal in the small uh, compressed way, when you do a lookup, uh, you will get uh, an anchor to that, or will you get the so, same thing that was stored during the registration? This this change would allow the resource directory to not return an anchor at all because the implicit anchor by following the rules of sixty six ninety is already evident from the rest of the message. Yes. Okay, and understand. it would also allow a resource directory to look at the anchor and invent a relative URI that in the context that the response is given resolves to the anchor that it wanted to send. In principle, yes. <laughs> yes. Not saying that everybody needs to implement that. I'm just saying you have license to do so. No, not even sure if there is any use case for that, but yes. So nothing would be broken, uh, override would be reduced. Uh, any downside in, in doing this change? Yes, I'll have to explain to the IESG or whoever has reviewed this that we were that we have done another change that was not on the original list of complaints. It probably needs a very big disclaimer in the write-up also. Uh, so it's more procedural downsides. 
uh, question is if it's worth it. Uh, I, I link it for a yes. Yeah, I think we are all. I, I also lean to yes, of course. This is much simpler, and you save a lot of uh, uh, bandwidth on the response. So why not? Uh, for the document, Christian, I, I think you mentioned it would be about giving clarification in the appendix uh, about limited link format and fixes to your implementation. But I guess that's under control. Yes. So I mean, we, we already have a place where we talk, where we kind of go through the existing rules in a tutorial fashion already. That's Appendix B. And we have a place where we outline what we do in ex in excess of the 6690 requirements to get all the implementations in line as Appendix C. So, of course, they would get updates, um, but it's not like there's anything completely new that needs added, adding. Right. And during the discussion on the list, not to mention today, I haven't heard any big objection anyway in, in proceeding. And sure, it's late, but seems just in time to me, actually. Uh, Fortunately, people are used to um, the, the, the RD extending its deadline a bit. <laughs> now. So once more than hard that much. <laughs> um, so if there is no more comments on this topic, um, if you could go back to the slides, I, I'll just like to go through the other open, open points again. It was just one slide, by the way, right? Uh, no, you can page up, page down to go to the next. Um... OK. You're absolutely right. So I share again. So the, um, the so there's two topics that are left over from last time that just needed group action. One is uh, the topic of server authorization, uh, where this originally came from um, the question about how bad is it if someone puts in a statement in the resource directory about someone who is not the, who is not the, the registrant. Um, and turns out this is the same topic we have with the, with the unauthenticated discovery. So Michael, you commented last time that OAuth basically because of all this suite of problems that could certainly be solved in a more elegant way, um, just recommends to only run a, a single service on one um, host or at one behind one um, behind one authority. Uh, do you have? I, any I, I, I don't have a reference for that, um, uh, but that's what I've observed in the field. So um, I would have to dig through the OAuth documents to see if it actually says that. It's just what I observe in the field is that basically is that you. Uh, it, it, it effectively, because of uh, you, you can't really send different cookies in your browser to different places, and so they solve that by not having more places. But we don't have cookies. No. But yeah, we... Yes, I, I understand that, but That's... you still have OS core uh, uh, contexts, right? So... Which is effectively I'm... the same thing uh, uh, in terms of they they go to a particular place, not by resource. We, we, have, we, have, we have a token with a set of claims associated to an OSCOR context, uh, or a DTLS context for that matter. And that set, and nothing in the request limits the set of claims, either from the client nor on the server, um, down to what the client actually intends with this request. So the way, for, the way forward I see here are, are two at two in parallel. One is to say that um, implementations have to be careful here, especially um, you should probably do as people do in OAuth, um, unless you have the have better control of the issue. And in parallel, follow, um, follow up with something that allows us to get better control. Um, but there is a mailing list thread on that, and I'll, I'd appreciate if people could comment on that, or of course not. I think we have to distinguish between the the, the aspect that uh, OAuth implementations have uh, run into all kinds of problems and therefore uh, contain a body of knowledge that we want to make use of, and uh, the the properties of OAuth 
itself because ours is kind of on the way out and uh, we we have to make sure that we can work with whatever is going to replace it um i'm not following oas too closely what does this mean for ace i mean as i understand ace is largely doing um taking the semantics of oas but putting them on into the core area so is, does this mean ACE, ACE might ha, might um, might be on the same way out, or does this mean that we have the chance to do something better with ACE and survive OAuth? Well, Michael just sent the reference to GNAP or NAP, depending on how you want to pronounce it. So this is uh, one working group that that does something that uh, might be replacing uh, OAuth. Uh, but in the, the ACE working group, we have had a long-standing uh, battle about whether the OAuth model was even right uh, for IoT, and it's certainly right for certain kinds of IoT, um, but uh, th there is a whole area that is not uh, being addressed by OAuth, where the OAuth people uh, kind of assumed in, in 2000, when did we decide that, 2017, um, that it, it might grow into that, but that hasn't happened. And now we have uh, GNAP and, and other proposals of uh, this kind. So I would expect that ACE will be rechartering to, to uh, pick up some of this work at some point in time. Um, but uh, for, for now, we just should make sure that resource directory is not married uh, to ours. So if we have a different uh, authentication model, and by the way, the, the, the standards that depend on CoAP mostly have their own authorization model, so they are not using OAuth uh, either. Um, so we should be able to work with all of them. Olaf, the other reindeer. Um, so, Christian, um, I think that the goal here is that, that um, was to learn from OAuth, not to cite it. Um, so whether or not ACE adopts it or replaces it, I don't think that exactly matters. Um, I, I, I'm not sure, but your example too in your email on that thread, uh, with the temperature becoming the time, um, it's kind of interesting, but, uh, um, I, I, it, it depends upon a, malicious rd operator and and i so i i was trying to understand that in the relationship to the other kind of issues um so that's where i'm kind of a bit lost here myself i think that it's just yeah i don't know i don't understand the relationships that's happening here the, the 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 two so we, we we face what I perceive as the same problem in two sides. The one side is um, we the, we we present the resource directory as an optimization, basically as a as something better, something more efficient than a as an efficient cache of of requesting to multicast, basically, um, which implies that the the resource directory should not really be trusted, um, at least in in some applications, um, to present um, correct information about the the registrants and then this me and then applications might still look into there and base their decisions um, on on what to send where on the output of the resource directory and in a and the same kind of problem comes up when the client, tries to find the resource directory and might be redirected to something that is a resource directory, but just the whole wrong point in it, um, which is basically the, the same problem just a step earlier. So so if we could solve the problem that the resource directory is essentially relaying untrusted information by adding some trust to the information that the resource directory couldn't change, then that would also solve the pr second problem of having to put some trust in the resource directory because then we could simply it could be whatever wouldn't matter right that that well, that's that, what i'm hearing 
that we're caching not, statements that don't include identities? Um, I, I don't know. Um, so one one way forward here is to is to ask the to ask the client in in all situations to verify that whoever whichever information gets mangled into that that request that eventually gets sent um, come from an an entity that is trusted with that to to, to the necessary I, I... amount to that to that request. Um, thing is we have different ways of achieving that and a we have to pick one in the discovery and b um we'll have to recommend something to application authors we can be a bit squishy on the recommendation side but we have to say something about how to discover an rd um well part of the issue is that you know rd.example.com we have no real way or time.example.com we have no way of mapping that to an identity to know if it was really even stated for them. That, that's what's coming down. If the resource directory simply cached um, identity XYZ said blah, 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 then it would always up, be up to the client to say, well, that's not a valid identity according to my system. It doesn't matter if it's cached or not. It's just untrusted. Yeah, but right. we can't we, we can't we can't assign we can't associate that information, especially not in a in a signed way, um, with the um, with the information in a link format. So that would be kind yeah, of I realize that that's the problem. I think that that's um, the problem is that this link format is just not really. Helpful. And even and even if we could, that would I mean we we we. There, there are probably ways to do even direct services for this, but this would wind up with some kind of. I mean, if the resource directory is not the is not in the part of the trust chain as it should not be, um, then this would basically one um, make give us um, individually signed links and so on, so that the the RD could pass them on efficiently or or some kind of Merkle trees or what or not. But it's at least it makes things a whole lot more complicated. Um, and one easy way out is for the client to go to the original authority and ask whether the properties that are fed into the later operations are actually as they were claimed. Um, this is probably okay in the in the RD discovery process um, because it means that's only one rare case when the when the client has to send another request. But for applications that depend on the RD. Um, that might easily double their discovery traffic. So it's it's an easy way out for, for RD, and I th I'm leaning towards taking that. Um, but this doesn't really say anything about what we should tell the tell the tell the RD users. So I guess you have more slides, Christian, right? Following this one. Um, yes, if we still have time, I mean, the uh, kind of yeah, bit, yeah. <laughs> bit backup style. Uh, yeah, then next one, please. So another thing we talked about last time is that we don't, we can't really um, ensure that the requests arrive at the resource directory in a sorted way, which is basically coming from the comments about replay, replay protection. So um, the 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 trouble one would have if requests to the RD could be replayed um, extend even beyond replay. Um, what we talked about last time was that echo would be an option to um, to mitigate that. Um, reading um, uh, the original curb specification again, I found that even eTag might be an option because there is this great um, thing called the tag representation in there. Uh, that would basically allow us to even associate an e-tag with the, with the state of the registration. 
and then just ask the client to send that e tag again as, as an uh, as an if match, and then we would get basically the same thing as with Echo, just that it's nicely scoped to the resource rather than being a thing between the client and the server. Um, so the current pull request, and as discussed last time, um, I've made this into a pull request first so that we have actual text to talk about, um, shows the two and a half options we have for this. One is using Echo, the other is eTag, and the half option is only good against deletion, that is the resource directory picking different um, registration, resource, uh, registration resources each time um, a device comes back. So it's, it might, it's, it's at best a partial solution. Um, the thing that's holding back the e-tag approach, which I generally would prefer, is that I'm not sure whether it's conceptually okay for the server to say that precondition failed if the client didn't even send an e-tag so that in effect, the server would be asking the client, hey, send this with if match that e tag, or else I won't accept it. And the other question is if it can send the current e tag with that error response so that the client can, in the event of a desynchronization, um, properly um, resume the registration. If those two hold, and Carsten, you're probably the best qualified for that because you were one of the original authors. Um, then we might manage to do this without etag, which saves us normative uh, without echo, which saves us a normative dependency, and generally is using the concept that is in say more regular cases where the client puts something somewhere and then changes it by putting something else there, um, as it's, it's it would be using the same mechanism. Yeah, um, so essentially we are saving the normative uh, dependency by inventing something else that can be used in its place. And I'm not sure we are, in, are we inventing something? I mean, that's that's what eTag is largely for, isn't it? Well, eTag is mostly there so a, a client can uh, verify that, that a cached representation is, is uh, still useful. Okay, yeah, um, that too. And uh, uh, yeah, so so giving giving more application semantics to if match is uh, certainly a, a questionable uh, thing. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean that we we absolutely cannot do this, uh, but I think we should be really certain of of. Uh, uh, what we are doing here and, and whether it has the right consequences. And I haven't thought about this uh, very much yet. Uh, the other thing, sending an e tag in a precondition failed response is certainly interesting. Okay. <laughs> we, we may not want to use the precondition failed, we may, may want to use something else. Um, but still. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have to read that uh, stuff. Okay. And this means next slide then. Um, yeah, but that's basically um, the rest just needs me pouring a few more days into that. So, um, yeah, that, that's basically the last pull request. Karsten has already put some put in some valuable stuff in there. Um, so if if someone else could also do that, it might help. Just because this is something where a lot of new text is is going in without um, without having the benefit of the several iterations that the rest had. Right. Seems things are wrapping up well. Uh, anyway, Christian. <laughs> Okay, uh, I guess this concludes all your overview on open points on the RD, right? Yes. So, um, I, I just have a question. At a previous meeting, I brought up 
making Christian the first author on, on this document? Are we, are we done with that? Is that decision taken? Yes, that's going to happen. Thank you. <laughs> um, we bike shed probably a, a bit the exact meaning of editor. Uh, it can be ambiguous if editor is greater than author or not. Uh, but yeah, um, but if, if Christian is happy with that, uh, I think everybody else should be happy with that and we can just do it. Right. So yes, Christian, go ahead with that too. In Thank the you. Submission, sure. Uh, I had a side question for Karsten, by the way, uh, about the status of the CoreConf write-ups. Yes. If anybody knows how to reach Ivailo, please tell me. Is he not responsive to Maze? No. Okay. I uh, think he simply doesn't see my, my emails. There must be something about my emails that uh, uh, makes... Uh, Uh, Evalu system drop them because I, in, in other groups, uh, in, for instance, in COSI, uh, it seems that he never saw my messages when replying to other messages. Uh, so th it might be a technical problem. <laughs> so if, if uh, you guys could maybe uh, ask him what's going on, uh, that, that would help. <laughs> yeah, thanks for saying. Um, I, I can reach out to him, ask him to send you a mail, and probably that, that will start working. Uh, or otherwise, I can recommend other channels. It used to be off and on Jabber, but since ITF 108 or so, he, he stopped. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why, but okay, I'll, I'll give it a try, Karsten, and come back to you. Yeah. He hasn't been on Telegram for a while either, so. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is, isn't, the, isn't, isn't this whole instant messaging thing all moving towards metrics anyway? <laughs> is it? It depends on whom you ask. Well, mm -hmm. I think leading terrorists still recommend Telegram. <laughs> uh, I wish people would go back to Java, but that's uh, lost hope. Or I have you tried, by the way, have you tried LinkedIn? And that usually gets an answer no matter what. Okay. Uh, anyway, I sent him an email. Let's see if he replies. Thank you. Thank you, Jaime. Uh, is this about final feedback on open points on the drafts, I guess? Yeah, I, I need some answers to be able to complete the, the write-ups. Okay. Um, and, yeah, okay. That's for the core, right? Hey, actually, I have some... I was just checking LinkedIn. So, Ivailo now is a software engineer at Google since August. So, probably the Accio email isn't working if, if you're trying that. Ah, okay. Yeah. So Thank you, you might, uh, yeah, you might want to try uh, LinkedIn or, or something else. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Uh, is the new address in the drafts? I have no idea. Or I wonder if the drafts are still using the, the, the old one of Aclio. <laughs> okay. But you wrote him to our, to him already. Good. Um, okay. Just a quick question about CoreConf. Um, are there public, good public implementations about that you that anyone could recommend? Because I might need to have a look into that at some point. And an implementation is always a good point to start. That's also something to ask to Eva, probably. Okay. Thanks. So okay. if I just send a message to the COSI mailing list uh, 48 hours ago that came from Evalu at Eclio. Well, I mean, if you check the LinkedIn, I mean, it's, it's there. So okay. Maybe he's using both hands. We, we solve this mystery. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> ciao, ciao. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah, sorry, Marco, I was closing the meeting for you. <laughs> Please go ahead. Yeah, well, someone left already. But uh, yeah, if there's no other points to discuss that anyone wants to raise, 
I think we can close the meeting. We, we have one more interim. Uh, we don't have out of our heads big topics in queue uh, to discuss. So, of course, let's keep the interim scheduled till the last moment. But uh, we may eventually uh, cancel that one if nothing is active to discuss. I'm sure there will be enough uh, little items we want to discuss about resource directory and other things. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens around the cutoff. <laughs> yeah, you, you'd be nice to. Much. I wonder if we can make it um, some nice announcement during the next ITF, like uh, IOG having enough time to review the latest version of RD. I don't know how long it usually takes them for these kind of secondary reviews or third. Is it the second uh, or the third it's one? It's strictly proportional uh, to the time you need to uh, process the the first uh, round of comments because uh, oh. the 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 ISG has to read so many documents that the knowledge about what happened just falls out of the cache over time. Mm. So the longer you wait in submitting a new version, the longer the processing of that will take. Mm -hmm. And that's well, why it's sometimes a good idea to even submit a new version that only addresses part of the comment, so the cache is refreshed. Yeah, I'll <laughs> keep that in mind. Yes, let's refresh their cache. Cool. Okay, uh, if there's nothing else, then we can close the meeting. And Thank you. To... Thank you all. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you.